Good evening, everybody. Time for us to get started. We are starting Deuteronomy tonight. Continuing our study of the law, we finished up with Numbers on Sunday. And that leaves Israel on the plains of Moab, so just right outside of the Promised Land. They're just on the east side of the, uh, the Jordan River. Uh, remember, the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have already taken possession of their territory, uh, but they have promised that they are going to cross the Jordan with the rest of Israel, at least their, their fighting men will, and they're going to go help conquer the Promised Land. Um, but we know that work doesn't start until the book of Joshua. So for this whole book, the book of Deuteronomy, Israel's not going to budge an inch. They're going to be encamped in the plains of Moab for the entire book. And that's, that's where they've been, that's where they're going to be. So like we normally do, I want us to consider uh, just some really basic introductory stuff about the book. Um, the English name, well, it's, it's kind of English. This is, I mean, you can just look at this word and tell it's not an English word, right? Um, so this derives from Greek, uh, and it basically just means second law. Uh, law coming from namos, second or two coming from deuteros. Uh, and the reason why in, uh, in the Old Greek uh, translation of the Old Testament it's referred to as Deuteronomy, is that we get a second giving of the law. In fact, nearly half of the book is dedicated to essentially a repetition of the law and a filling out of the law. Now, we're gonna, as soon as we finish the narrative portions of this book, we're going to dig into like, the law segments. And you'll, we'll get to see, and this is the reason why I've, uh, I've put this class together this way, you'll get to see you know, the different angles that, uh, that Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy take on different issues. It's not that we're receiving different commandments per se, because we know that God is one and God doesn't contradict himself. Um, but you'll see that they, uh, they have addressed different contexts. We'll get to that when we get to it. Um, but a big, big chunk of the book has to do with the law. The, like we always do, I want us to consider the Hebrew name. Now, Deuteronomy is a good name for it. Uh, it's not like with some of the other books um, where it's only kind of, sort of, a decent name. Deuteronomy is a good name. Um, the Hebrew name, well, before we put it up, um, remember, how do, um, how do we get the Hebrew names of the books? Usually first words, yeah. Um, and in Hebrew, well, I mean, you look at, look at Deuteronomy 1.1 1, 1 in English. These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. Um, in Hebrew, one of the first words, I think it's actually the second word, is devarim, which just means words or sayings, and it's actually, it, it, davar is a really generic word in Hebrew, it can even just mean things, uh, obviously here in this context it's words, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel, and this title is, well, it, like with Numbers, Numbers, remember the, the Hebrew title of Numbers is Bamidbar, in the wilderness. Um, and that is especially fitting because the entire book, they are wandering around in the wilderness. The lost generation dies in the wilderness. So the whole thing is dominated by their presence in the wilderness. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Deuteronomy, the Hebrew name of it, means the words or the sayings. And this is especially appropriate because uh, as you look at what I've just handed out, this is an outline of the book. The entire book, the vast, vast majority of the text in the book of Deuteronomy, consists of Moses speaking. All right, And if you ever get tempted to think 
that I get long-winded. Just wait till you get a load of Moses. <laughs> because the, in, the entire thing can be divided up basically into three speeches um, that Moses gives to the congregation of Israel while they are encamped in the plains of Moab. Um, the first one, excuse me, there's, there's a bit of a structure to this. The first one of these sayings, the first speech that Moses gives is a, a reminder. All right, so his first speech, which takes up basically the first four chapters, um, looks back. So we are going to get a, a recounting of the Exodus. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we are going to get a reminder of all of the things that the Lord has done. Um, and that leads us up to the second discourse. The second speech. Essentially, is not, it doesn't gonna look, it's not going to look at the present. Necessarily, this is not necessarily a temporal thing, like a, a, a time thing. Uh, but we can categorize this by directions. The second speech is almost completely focused on God. Um, considering the love of God and how we ought to love God. And it culminates in the giving of uh, what we commonly call the Deuteronomic Code. All right, so that's, that's the law portion of the book of Deuteronomy. That takes up chapters 12 through 26. So in this part of the study, we're going to pass that part of the book up and come back to it uh, along with the rest of the laws that we have passed over in our study. Um, so, but it's all about orienting ourselves towards God, Israel orienting itself towards God. Then the third discourse, tell you what, I'll just murder markers. Here we go. The third discourse looks ahead uh, because the book ends with this it's a section that I have us turn to every once in a while and just take little snippets out of. Um, but you have this ceremony um, where part of the congregation of Israel gets up on Mount Gerizim and part of the congregation gets up on Mount Ebal. It's two mountains that are real close to each other. And as they're doing that, Moses pronounces blessings and curses uh, for either obeying or disobeying the, the words of the law. And like, all through all of these discourses, you're going to see Moses just pleading with Israel to obey the words of the law, obey the covenant. We've, we've not seen that so much in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Right? We get that... Um, we get that message in that whenever Israel disobeys, they get punished. Right? But as we read Deuteronomy, you are going to see Moses practically on his knees through the entire book, begging Israel, just listen to the words. Just do what God tells you. Because if you do, here's what God is going to do for you. Right? And he, he paints a picture that is, I mean, it's, there's a reason why Deuteronomy is sometimes referred to as the gospel of love. Have you ever heard it called that? Um, it is, I don't know if we hear it so much in our circles, but um, it, it is sometimes referred to as the gospel of love because as we read through Deuteronomy, you are going to see just how absolutely chock full of God's love it is. Um, and it really comes to a head in the third discourse as Moses is pronouncing all of these blessings. But, if Israel disobeys, 
then Moses pronounces all of these curses that are going to fall on Israel. We, we saw this a little bit at the end of Numbers. Remember, um, the Lord tells Israel at the end of Numbers that if they disobey him, uh, that he is going to do to them what he intended to do to the pagans that live in the promised land that they're supposed to be driving out. Right? He's going to treat them exactly the same way. And that is spelled out in horrific detail at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Some of the things that we read there at the end are, I mean, they turn your stomach. I mean, we're literally talking about you know, God warns Israel that things are going to get so bad that your pregnant women are going to be eating their babies. Like, and that's, uh, that's just part of it. It goes on for a while. <coughs> Excuse me. And so it is looking forward. Obey and everything's going to be great. Disobey and everything is going to be worse than you could possibly imagine. But, and this is, this is where, it, um, where it's suitable to call it a gospel of sorts. Not, not gospel in the sense that it's not testifying explicitly about Jesus Christ, but it does point forward to Jesus Christ uh, because the end message is that even whenever Israel does turn astray, they can repent. They can change. They can beg for forgiveness. And what's going to happen? Is God going to ignore them? No. God is going to forgive them, and God is going to save them, and is going to return the blessings that he promised to them if they repent. All right, then the very close of the book, uh, chapters 31 through 34, is basically some wrapping up, excuse me, including the curious matter of Moses recording his own death. We'll get to that when we get to it. Um, but we have several um, smaller speeches from Moses where he provides some final instructions to the congregation um, and to the, the Levites. Um, the Lord commands him to write a song, and so Moses writes a song and teaches it to Israel that we call the Song of Moses. Um, and then the Lord commands him to bless Israel, and so he finishes by blessing Israel, and then he dies. Uh, and then that's that. So I think we're pretty well ready to jump into the book and start listening to the first of these speeches. Any questions or comments before we begin? All right, let's pray together, and then we'll get into our reading. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for the great gifts that you have given us today. Thank you, Father, so much for blessing us with this night, for giving us time together to study from your word. And Father, help us to see your love pouring forth from the law. Help us, Father, to recognize that, uh, that you chose Israel to show us your will and to point the way forward to your Messiah. Righteous Father, we thank you that you have sent him to us. Uh, we're thankful, Father, that we get to receive gifts that Moses was looking forward to, uh, gifts that angels longed to look into, as your servant Peter tells us. And righteous Father, help us as we study the book of Deuteronomy to see those promises being made, to see the groundwork being laid for the coming of your Son. And help us, Father, as we consider these words to become more faithful, more steadfast in our service to your Son. Help us to be good servants in your kingdom, Father. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 1. <clears throat> These are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arba, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazrot, and Dizahab. It is eleven days' journey from Horeb, by the way of Mount Seir, to Kadesh Barnea. How long did it take them? <laughs> Forty years. In the fortieth year, on the first day of the eleventh month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them, after he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of, uh, king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtoreth, uh, and in Edrei. 
Beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, saying, and here we'll, we'll get to the saying in just a second. I want to remind us of the setting a little bit here, because there's a little bit of overlap um, here between what's going on here at the beginning of Deuteronomy um, and what happened at the end of Numbers. Uh, we should bear in mind, by the way, that our biblical histories don't always function in the way that we think that history ought to function. Right? What do, what do we think history looks like? I mean, if you're reading history, yeah, it's got to be laid out in order. Right? And it is, you know, just purely neutral facts. There's no, there's no kind of moral to the facts. It's just, and they're laid out completely in order. Um, not so with the Scriptures. Often, the, the inspired works um, give deference to whatever point they're trying to make, right? So, Moses has a point in writing Numbers, and Moses has a point in writing Deuteronomy, and he is going to report things, and again, remember, the Spirit's inspiring him to do this. He is going to report things in such a way that suit that purpose, right? So, don't necessarily think that, all right, we just hit the end of Numbers and then chronologically that gets us into the beginning of Deuteronomy. He has placed us, in verse 4, after he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan. All right, that happened way back in chapter 21. Uh, sorry, at Numbers chapter 21. All right, that's where Sihon and Og are defeated. Um, so he begins, at least Deuteronomy gives us to, uh, to believe that he begins these discourses at that point. All right, so these are things that he would have been saying as, well, I mean, what happens after the defeat of Sihon and Og? What starts happening in Numbers chapter 22 yeah, Balaam. Barak tries to get Balaam to curse Israel. In the midst of that, Moses is teaching Israel. Right? Uh, what does Israel end up doing? Well, Balaam's not able to curse them, but what does Israel do? They end up worshiping the Baals. Right? Baal Peor. In the midst of that, Moses has been preaching to them. Right? As... Um, as Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh are trying to settle into their land on the eastern side of the Jordan, Moses is preaching to them. All right, so that's the context of all of this. All right, so let's come back to Deuteronomy 1, verse 6. This is what Moses said. The Lord our God said to us in Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah in the hill country, and in the lowland, and in the Negev, and by the sea coast, the land of the Canaanites, and Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to, to, get, sorry, to give to them and to their offspring after them. At that time, I said to you, I will not be able to bear you by myself. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and behold, you are today as numerous as the stars of heaven. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are, and bless you as he has promised you. How can I bear by myself the weight and burden of you and your strife? Choose for your tribes wise, understanding, and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. And you answered me, the thing that you have spoken is good for us to do. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and experienced men, and set them as heads over you, commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, commanders of fifties, commanders of tens, and officers throughout your tribes. And I charged your judges at that time, hear the cases between your brothers, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the alien who is with him. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike, you shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. In the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me, and I will hear it. 
And I commanded you at that time all the things that you should do. All right, so this is, this is all stuff that we have read before in Numbers. Right, where um, Moses says that the burden of the people is too great, and so the Lord imparts some of his spirit on some of these elders of the people. All right, verse 19. Then we set out from Horeb, and by the way, um, what, is, what is Mount Horeb? What's the other name that we know Horeb by? Sinai, yeah, Mount Sinai, same mountain. <clears throat> then we set out from Mount Horeb and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send men before us, that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. The thing seemed good to me, and I took twelve men from you, one man from each tribe. And they turned and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshol and spied it out. And they took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. All right. At this point, this is also stuff that we should remember from the book of Numbers, having just studied it. But this should sound different to us. All right. Look at the way that Moses reports uh, or recounts the sending out of the 12 spies. Uh, but let's start with the obvious thing, what he says in verse 25. They took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. What's the report that you remember Israel receiving in Numbers chapter 13? Well, from most of the spies, it was not good. Now, of course... From Caleb the son of Jephunneh and from Joshua, the report, they, well, this was their report. Uh, Moses is doing something here uh, because there's, there's another interesting detail here that's a little different from what we might remember in Numbers 13. Um, in verse 22, he says, Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send men before us that they may explore the land, etc. Keep your finger there and go back to Numbers 13. Look at the first couple of verses of Numbers 13. In Numbers, whose idea is it to send out the spies? The Lord says to Moses, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the people of Israel. This is not a contradiction, by the way. This is, uh, it's pretty easy to, uh, to mesh both of these things together. Uh, what... What's going on in Deuteronomy is this is part of Moses' strategy in dealing with Israel. Whose fault is it that they were faithless? Whose fault is it that they had to wander around for 40 years? It was their own. And so Moses pins all of the action on them. Right? He focuses on their action. All of you came near and said, let's send men. All right? The thing seemed good to me, Moses said except that apparently their motives were faithless. Now, if we wanted to try to do some, you know, some harmony of the law, um, you know, like how we do sometimes with, like with the Gospels, you know, like doing a harmony of the Gospels, it would look something like uh, Israel comes to Moses and requests that they send men in, and so Moses asks the Lord, and then the Lord tells Moses, yeah, send the men. Right? And we're basically just reading different parts of that exchange in Numbers and in Deuteronomy. Um, in Numbers, it's focused on the Lord's activity. In Deuteronomy, it's focused on the people's activity, mainly how they are, well, how they provoke and how they are faithless. Now, the same thing is true of the report. All right, so in, in verse 25, the report 
at least the report that mattered, is it is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. Verse 26, yet you, notice again how Moses is pinning it on them. Whose fault is it? It's their fault. Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we. The cities are great and fortified up to heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. All right, so some of the mighty men. All right, there, it's like we're getting the rest of the story. All right, the people focus on the report of the ten. All right, all of these people are so huge and their cities are fortified and we're toast. But the way that Moses presents it, it is only the, the faithful testimony, the testimony of Caleb the son of Jephunneh, that amounts to anything. It is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. But you guys, Moses said, chose to listen to the other men. And so you murmured against the Lord in your tents. So verse 29, Then I said to you, Do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God, who goes before you, will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son, all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God, who went before you in the way to seek you out a place to pitch your tents, in fire by night and in the cloud by day, to show you by what way you should go. All right, so again, Moses is pinning it on them. So as Moses is looking back at the things that have happened, he's focused on what Israel has done to be faithless to the Lord. You did not believe the Lord your God, despite what he did. Right? He's, he's done everything. All right, so, verse 34. I tell you what, let me... This is all stuff that we have gone over before in Numbers, but let me not rush through it. Any questions or comments up to this point? Okay, verse 34. And the Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore, not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because he, was, he has wholly followed the Lord. Even with me the Lord was angry on your account, and said, You also shall not go in there. Joshua the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. And as for your little ones, who you said would become prey... And your children, who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall go in there, and to them I will give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn, and journey into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. Then you answered me, we have sinned against the Lord. We ourselves will go up and fight, just as the Lord our God commanded us. And every one of you fastened on his weapons of war, and thought it easy to go up into the hill country. And the Lord said to me, Say to them, Do not go up or fight, for I am not in your midst, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, and you would not listen. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the hill country. Then the Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you and chased you as bees do and beat you down in Seir as far as Hormah. And you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord did not listen to your voice or give ear to you. So you remained at Kadesh many days, the days that you remained there. <clears throat> right. so again, Moses pins it on them. I tried talking to you. Right. I gave you the word of the Lord, Moses says, but you did not listen. Right. Chapter 2. We're going to kind of blaze through this part because it's, for us, it's essentially review. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. 
and for many days we traveled around Mount Seir. Then the Lord said to me, You've been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward and command the people. You are about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir. And they will be afraid of you, so be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau for a possession. You shall purchase food from them with money that you may eat, And you shall also buy water from them with money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the working of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So we went on, away from our brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, away from the Araba road, from Elat and Ezion Geber. Okay, so they're not allowed... To, to do anything to Esau. They're not allowed to in, uh, invade Edom, uh, identified here as Seir, yeah, after the mountain. Uh, they're not allowed to take any of the territory of the sons of Esau. Why? All right, because the, the Lord is protecting them. Right, look at what the Lord says about it in verse 5. Don't contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land, no, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. What does that sound like? I mean, that that sounds familiar, that language. I mean, who do we normally think of as God, you know, giving land for a possession? Israel. Keep that in mind. This is not the last time we're going to see this. We're about to see it again. But the Lord says to Israel, I have given Edom their land is a possession as well. All right, uh, let's see. We're in the middle of verse 8. We turned and went in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession because I have given Ar to the people of Lot for a possession. The Amim formerly lived there, a, great, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also counted as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them Amim. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place, as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. All right, there's a lot going on there. The, the, the narrative kind of goes back and forth between Moab and Edom. All right, so we've talked about Edom. Edom's the descendants of Esau, and, I mean, why are they special? Well, because Esau is also a descendant of Abraham. All right? What makes Moab special? Well, where does Moab come from? Who's Moab's father? You remember that story from Genesis 19? Yeah, so you remember, I mean, the the thing that we mainly remember about Genesis 19 is Sodom and Gomorrah getting nuked, right? What happens afterward? Well, what happens to Lot? Yeah, he and his daughters end up living in a cave and... Some, I'll just say some unsavory things happen in that cave, <laughs> resulting in the births of two sons, Moab and Ben-Ami. Ben-Ami is the, the father of the Moabites, and Moab is the father of the Moabites. Remember, Moab means from dad. Um, but the Lord says, I have given Ar, that is this, this land, to the people of Lot... So that is the nation of Moab. I've given it to them for a possession. Now look at what happens in verse 10. The Emim formerly lived there, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also counted as Rephaim, so that is like giants or mighty men. But the Moabites call them Emim. Okay. 
Now, this should make the story of Moab look very, very familiar. Moab is promised a land by the Lord, and they have to go into the land and dispossess a people that already live there who are mighty and tall. What's that sound like? That sounds like Israel's story, doesn't it? I mean, that's exactly Israel's story. Moses, I think, wants us to see this connection. That Israel has been told to go into Canaan and dispossess the people who live there. And why won't Israel go in? They are scared because the people are big and tall and they're like the sons of Anakim. Right? Israel won't go in. Moab goes in. That's, that's really subversive, isn't it? Because we always think of Moab as being like really, really evil. And in the, the, the scheme of things, they are pretty evil. Um, because I mean, what have they done at the end of the book of Numbers? Well, we know that they worship the Baals. They've made Israel worship the Baals. How many people died in Israel on account of that? 24,000 died in Israel on account of that. Moab is some pretty bad news. All right, and it's just going to get worse as it goes along. But whenever God told Moab, here is your possession, and notice that God has done the same thing for Moab that he's done for Israel. He has chosen an inheritance for them and taken them into their inheritance, and they go in and they dispossess these giants, these mighty men whom they call the Emim. They do it. All right? Continue in verse 12. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, all right, so we're switching back to Edom now, who we read about before. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place. And here, Moses makes the connection explicit. As Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave to them. All right, so Moses is... Uh, he's, he's looking ahead to when Israel is going to conquer their land, right? It hasn't happened yet. Um, but he wants us to make this connection completely clear. The Edomites, the sons of Esau, the exact same thing happened to them. The Lord comes to them and says, here is your inheritance, right? Here's your land. Here's what I'm giving you. But they have to go in and they have to defeat this mighty people, the Horites, and they do it. They go into the land and dispossess them. All right, so out of the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Israelites, who are the only ones that refuse to go in? It's Israel. Who are the only ones that are, that are faithless on this count? It's Israel. All right, now Moab, we know that Moab and Edom are faithless on other counts. But remember, Moses is trying to really pin Israel's sin on them. They have been so unfaithful that they won't even rise to the level of Moab or Edom. So now, verse 13, Now rise up and go over the brook Zered. So we went over the brook Zered. And the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years until the entire generation, that is the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them, to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. So as soon as all the men of war had perished and were dead from among the people, the Lord said to me, Today you are to cross the border of Moab at Ar. And when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them, for I will not give any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession. All right, we see where this is going, all right? because I have given it to the sons of Lot for a possession. It is also counted as a land of the Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites call them Zamzumim, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim, but the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, as he did for the people of Esau who live in Seir when he destroyed the Horites before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. As for the Avim, who lived in the villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftorim, who came from Kaftor, uh, who came from Kaftor, destroyed them and settled in their place. All right, so the Lord's added another to the list. 
All right, even the Amorites have been faithful in, in this regard, where Israel has not. Rise up, set out on your journey, and go over the valley of the Arnon. Behold, I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to take possession and contend with him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you on the peoples who are under the whole heaven, who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. So I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemot to Sihon the king of Heshbon with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land. I will go only by the road. I will turn aside neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot, as the sons of Esau who live in Seir and the Moabites who live in Ar did for me, until I go over the Jordan into the land that the Lord our God is giving to us. But Sihon the king of Heshbon would not let us pass by him, for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate so that he might give him into your hand as he is this day. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to take possession that you may occupy his land. Then Sihon came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Yahaz. And the Lord our God gave him over to us, and we defeated him and his sons and all his people. And we captured all his cities at that time and devoted to destruction every, uh, every city, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. Only the livestock we took as spoil for ourselves with the plunder of the cities that we captured. From Aroar, which is on the edge of the valley of the Arnon, and from the city that is in the valley, as far as Gilead, there was not a city too high for us. The Lord our God gave all into our hands. Only to the land of the sons of Ammon did you not draw near, that is, to all the banks of the river Jabbok and the cities of the hill country, whatever the Lord our God had forbidden us. All right, so here the story starts to take of a positive turn, right? As soon as Israel starts obeying the Lord, then they start seeing the same results that all of the other people did. Uh, and in fact, we're going to see this continued at the beginning of chapter 3, whenever they defeat Og, the king of Bashan. Uh, because we're going to see Og in particular, you know, as, as goofy a name as he has, um, Og is he, he fits that archetype of just gigantic tall dude. Like he actually, I think, is a giant just based on the measurement of his bed. Um, and he has these really high fortified cities. All of this stuff that Israel had been afraid of and God gives him into their hand as soon as they decide they're going to start listening to him and obeying. All right, any final questions or comments before we wrap it up this evening? All right, thank you so much for your uh, time and attention this evening.